I would love to be with you in person. I like doing talks like this in person. I like to be able to, you know, engage and walk around, uh, talk with people, things like that. But this is the best we can do right now. Also, I would I like to show off my wide array of ocean themed neckties. But in this virtual age, we also, I think, decided to be more casual. So instead, you get my ocean themed Hawaiian shirt. Um, so, with that, so uh, I don't need to tell you much more about me. Again, um, you know, in the Navy for 32 years, um, uh, I specialized in oceanography, navigation, and meteorology during my career, time at sea, time overseas, doing a lot of different things, some related to my specialties and some not. So happy to take any questions about any of that as we go along. I will be pausing at a couple of intervals throughout for questions, so I encourage you as was set up front to go ahead and type questions in as they enter your, you know, as you think about them going through here and then I'll stop and we'll go, go through some of them, hopefully. Uh, I know they're gonna be so many. <laughs> All right. Um, so uh, anyway, so my wife Lisa and I live in the Woodmont area of Arlington, uh, have for some time now, several years. Um, we are also proud members of the Clarendon United Methodist Church and, uh, you know, I continue to be very impressed with this area. Um, looks like we're going to be here for a while. One reason if they, is thanks a lot to all of you. We really love the neighborhood, the people around here. You are leaders. You are very active and engaged and really create the kind of environment that we just love. So I want to thank you, all of you especially, for the great work you've done on behalf of many different things, and especially a lot of us. So. Um, just thanks. It's an honor to be here and speak with you for this period. Uh, so anyway, that's enough about you. Back to me. All right. So again, this is the title of my talk. I'm going to talk about national security in the ocean and a few other things. And of course, it's all wrapped up in climate change as well. I'm going to walk through a lot of that, hopefully, and give you a little bit of insight. So first of all, the organization that I run now has been around in one form or another since the middle 1970s. Uh, again, we're a consortium of organizations, largely academic ocean science organizations, such as University of Maryland, University of Florida, Virginia, South Carolina, Maine, Woods Hole, Scripps, Hawaii, and about 90 pe members. It also includes Old Dominion um, and William and Mary, so a lot of Virginia activities in there as well. You can see what our mission is. Um, and that's what basically we do. We don't actually do any active research, don't have any people on my staff actually going to see. I have about 35 people on my staff right now, but we represent the organizations who do that and try to ensure that we are basically, we're all speaking in some type of harmony. We're singing in some type of, of harmony, which can be a challenge with this many institutions. Um, so in terms of the kind of things we do, and some people sort of ask, you know, if you like what I have to say or concerned about oceans, can I, I donate? Most of our work is through programs that are funded by the government or through our dues from our members. We do, however, have one education program, uh, been around for 23 years, called the National Ocean Sciences Bowl. If you want to find it, you should want to actually go in and donate. This is high school quiz bowl and experience type of learning. And we have regions all over the country where high school kids get to come and do experiences regionally. The regional winners of the Quiz Bowl get to come to a national competition. This past April, on the weekend of Earth Day, we did it virtually. Uh, first time ever. It was a big success. So anyway, there's that. Okay, so going back now, my organization was founded in its current form in the mid-90s by Admiral James Watkins four-star Navy Admiral, former Chief of Naval Operations, former Secretary of Energy. And he took and formed this organization. And then around the turn of the century, he was asked to lead uh, the, U the U.S. Commission on Ocean Policy, which published a blueprint for the ocean in 2004. This was the vision that was put forward of what he and his team of brilliant scientists and leaders from across our nation said, this is what we should be shooting for. We adhere to this today. Again, it's 15, 16, 17 years later, this is what we want to see. So he also, and by the way, this is the most, this and the next slide are the only two slides you're going to see a lot of text. 
Uh, but you can see it's all about these type of things. So, and then he said, okay, when he had to testify about this report to both Howard, to both houses of Congress and, um, you know, various other type of convenings, this is what he said on where we were at that point. Again, many agencies, federal, state, deal with ocean issues, ocean science issues. People want to make the right decisions around ocean and weather and climate. And, but they need understandable information. But one of the big thing is we need people to really understand the importance of the ocean, especially with us as a maritime nation. So this is where we were then. I would argue how much has really changed. And I think Admiral Watkins, where he actually alive today and not over in Arlington Cemetery, he would probably say, yeah, it's about the same. What you hear now a lot is based on climate change, sea level rise, ocean acidification, things we're going to talk about, is this where we are right now? Are we on the brink of massive type of failure and destruction, life as we know it? Now we're in the middle of a, certainly with COVID-19, a pandemic adds certainly anxiety and fear and a lot of where are we going? Uh, but as far as the ocean goes, you know, are we or not? I suggest we're not on the brink, but we are getting there. But we have great opportunities that lie ahead and I'll be talking about those. Usually I give out chocolates for people to raise their hand and answer a question and I ask them, where is this? Most of the high school students don't get it. A few of the college ones do. I know all of you would get it. This is the apotheosis or the inside of the tallest point in our capital, uh, right looking up from the rotunda. And I suggest some of the Congress people don't look up enough as they're walking through here. This is what it looks like, a painting from back in the mid 1800s. Uh, and you see it, you know, there's George Washington, the 13 colonies represented in the middle. Uh, at the six o'clock place on this, you will see war or d defense right there is represented as one of the six founding concepts of our nation as they saw it then. And going a little, going around clockwise to the eight o'clock position, you have science with Benjamin Franklin right there. Going around to the 10 o'clock possession, you, you have maritime interests. And from there, then it's commerce, it's industry or mechanics, and then it's agriculture. So you can see with defense and science and maritime interests, that pretty much is where I'm coming from. And I suggest not just the founding, but the future of our nation is reliant upon our ability to understand this as one of the transformational concepts that got us started and one of the transformational concepts that will get us toward the future, not just as a nation, but as a planet. Okay, so things change. This is 40 years worth of aging uh, by me. Um, so you can see as I was uh, in high school on the left and back in um, then, and then what happened when I went forward uh, 40 years later. And you can say, yeah, well, you know, gone a little bit downhill in those 40 years, okay? Yeah, definitely not true, or that's, you know, that's hard to argue. However, at about the same age as that picture on the left, here is the coral reef I was certified to dive on as a freshman in college down in Florida at the Florida Institute of Technology, where I got my first college degree. Uh, it was a beautiful, healthy reef off the coast of West Palm Beach area, gorgeous with fish and live coral and amazing things. 40 years later in the bottom right hand corner, that same reef is now bleached. It's dead as far as we believe, we think of coral reefs going. The coral organisms are all dead. Now it's algae and weeds and grasses. Still some life there, but quite different. So I will tell you that I think reefs, which usually have a lifespan on the order of thousands of years, now are doing worse than we are in terms of how rapidly they're going downhill, unfortunately just to give you an idea of what we're looking at and the changes in our ocean. Now, the other thing is pretty much know what's going to happen to me, okay? My future is pretty much certain. I'm not sure when, hopefully not too soon, but that's it. The good news is we still have time to fix a lot of problems in our ocean. So I don't want everybody to just say, well, what, are, what can we do? There are great opportunities, but we've got work to do. I look at all this now through the eyes of security and prosperity, as I indicated in my first slide. We have challenges with a growing global type of population, now roughly 8 billion, 
probably likely 10 billion by the middle of the century, weighing down upon this ocean planet, or planet Earth covered by 71% in water or ocean. And how, as that drives down our ability to sustain all life on the planet as we're seeing, what are the opportunities we had to increase the sustain sustainability and reduce the risk of catastrophic effects? And I suggest they all rely on these issues of knowledge and investment in science and knowledge and just having the entrepreneurial good ideas and being able to invest in those to drive down that risk. What are some of the challenges that we face? You know what a lot of them are. It's, you know, sea level rise associated with climate change, it's invasive species, it's ecosystems that have been in the balance, pollutants, plastics, all these things happening to our ocean right now. We see species going to be extinct and all these type of things. So, you know, we, we look at this and the ocean starts to have this murky sort of future. But then you go around and you talk to the brilliant young men and women in the universities and the young professors and then the people who are doing research throughout really all across our globe and you start to globe and you start to see science and technology has many solutions the ocean is understood now if you go back to when i was in college it's just it's night and day it's like we didn't even know there was an ocean out there like it is now and some of that is true technology these type of things of you know with battery life, miniaturization, artificial intelligence, data, just you know, by the reams of data that we can all have access to now. So that with that in combination with the science of understanding things such as environmental DNA, overall, what do the genes look like? What are the, what are the ecosystems and the gene genetic or ge genomic type of representation so we can understand how life is advancing or not advancing? And again, issues biochemistry. What does the ocean sound like? What should it sound like? How does the ocean and every law life in it actually behave? And like we do intelligence in the military around humans behave, now we can start to look at how life really behaves and how it should behave. So this holds great promise for us. So what we now, the challenge we face is how do we turn the scientific information, which is largely represented through the data that we extract from the ocean, the analytical work around that data, and that's really where the scientists and technologists come into play. But then we, one of the really important things, and I think you people here in Arlington understand this greatly is, I should say we here in Arlington understand this greatly, is the importance of communicating science and technology to decision makers, and that's through impact. What's the impact of a hurricane as it's coming along the coast there? What's the impact of a harmful algal bloom, the impact of sea level rise, dot, dot, dot. And then at some various places, people make a decision. It could be a personal decision, whether to evacuate or not, a decision to pass a new law, to invest in something. Should we invest in the military? Should we go in and move people from the coastal areas to others, whatever it may be, and then we have to act based on the right decisions. This is what I did in the military for many years is turn data analysis, which the senior admirals and generals that, you know, they don't, that, you know, they're up at the high levels. The people have to understand it, communicate it, and help them make a decision. The same thing works in this current realm and what I'm doing now. I look at things from the viewpoint, as I mentioned, of security and prosperity. We're gonna focus on national security first. The things to understand is that the ocean science and technology of exploring, observing, understanding, predicting, educating, and then taking the right action, going back to that scale, but these are more specified parts of the ocean scientific process. This is what we have to do to reduce the threats to our security and ensure our prosperity. And I'll go through that in more detail now. First of all, this is from NOAA, again, the National Ocean Service Party, and you say, what does the ocean mean to us? Again, over half of the air that we breathe, the oxygen comes from the phytoplankton in the upper parts of the ocean. It, the ocean regulates our climate. Look at 76% of all trade goes across our ocean. 
95% of internet activity goes across cables in the bottom of our ocean. We know what it means. Our, we have an ocean economy that the U.S. ocean economy is in billions with shipping, energy, and all these type of things. Not to mention the amount of food, 15% of the protein that's consumed globally comes from the sea. Medicine, many things that we're taking now, not in, you know, maybe even in the future, types of vaccines to various diseases and pandemics might come from ocean life, which we know is incredibly resilient to many changes. So this gives you, this is a snapshot of why this is so important and why a healthy, prosperous ocean is so important. So I'm going to do this, okay? Now, so I'm gonna talk about national security now. Uh, so we can see that basically a national security, let me make sure I've got this. Okay, yeah, there we go, okay. All right, sorry I'm having a few problems with my slides here. Hopefully I won't do that anymore. There we go, okay. National security. And then, you know, it's always going to fail on you in the middle of a big presentation. Uh, when we look at the impact of the ocean and climate and weather on our readiness, think of our military bases. In the top left is Tyndall Air Force Base after Hurricane Michael. I was born in Panama City. My father worked at Tyndall Air Force Base when I was young. So I lived next to a Navy diver stationed over in the Navy base in, in Panama City, but he worked at the Air Force Base. Basically, you know, with Hurricane Michael, $4 billion to rebuild that base. You could even argue, should it be rebuilt there or somewhere that's a little bit higher in sea level rise? Was that the right decision or not? I won't tell you yes or no, I'll just tell you these are the types of thoughts we need to be having. Impacts on ships and piers of sea level rise in Norfolk, you can see the pier, and that's a new pier that is being overrun, and that's not a hurricane, that's just a storm with a high tide event. Army and Marine Corps bases. And then also more and more our military is being called in to do um, basically to actually go in and support humanitarian assistance and disaster re relief type of operations. Very important. Some of them, in, and again, on the home front, think of the hospital work and the military hospitals to support our response to the current ongoing pandemic. Well, we do the same thing for things all over the world. What that does is it takes away our ability to train for the other types of missions that you're, we're actually being paid for and we're investing in. So there's an impact on readiness. There's also an impact on our effectiveness, the effectiveness of our forces to be able to go and do their job in our prediction of the environment, a changing Arctic, changing ocean under the ice, changing wave and surf conditions, can we do this? Can we be effective? Changing world in terms of how we're looking at everything. Think of, you know, a future ocean and along the coast of another nation now with lots of infrastructure and wind turbines and things like that. The landscape on our ocean is even changing. So understanding that the impacts of a changing ocean on our national security and our ability to do this, which is to maintain home field advantage, not just at the home games, but at the away games. This is what our military has relied on, a knowledge advantage of the environment for many, many years. All right, another national security issue, this is just one example, I mean, there are many more ties, but this is one I've been involved in. On the bottom right, you can see I've been spent a few minutes on 60 Minutes uh, last November talking about this issue of rare earth elements or rare earth m m m metallic compounds. We use these in our cell phones, in our missile guidance systems, in our navigation systems, in X-ray machines, microwaves. They're incredibly rare, they're only found a few places. One place that we know they are found, oh, and oh, by the way, we don't have any production capability on land or sea in the US right now. We buy it all from overseas. There's been a lot of concern. You can Google this and go look at all the things that are being said and written very recently. The importance is that we know in the bottom of the deepest parts of the ocean, including this area known as the Clarington Clipperton zone, southeast of Hawaii, extending almost to Central America, are lots of these rocks or nodules, polymetallic nodules or, or manganese nodules, they're called. They have a lot of these rare earth elements in there. 
But if we go start in harvesting these to get after this national security issue, we want to have our own sources of these rare earth elements, especially in the future with more technology. What happens when you start to pull these things off the bottom of the ocean, miles deep? We don't even understand how life works down there. We know it takes from 10 to hundreds of millions of years to form these nodules. We don't understand how these elements interact with other systems in the deep ocean, how that impacts life in the larger upper parts of the ocean. We need to understand this better. One thing I pointed out in 60 Minutes is we are not a signatory. The U.S. along with Iran and North Korea and a few other friends, very few, we are not signatories to the U.N. Convention on the Law of the Sea Treaty. Therefore, we don't get a seat at the table to say who can explore and mine where in this zone. We don't even get to go in and put our leases into place by based on international law because this is international ocean areas, not part of exclusive economic zone. This is beyond national jurisdictions. So an international body under UN Convention of the Sea has been stood up and we are an observer. So that's what I, my piece was. But these are the type of issues that are crucial. We really need these elements, but we also need to make sure that we and no one else screws up the ocean in ways that may not be able to recover for a really long time. Near peer competitors. So this gets into, if you look at our, our national security strategy of this administration, talks about near peer competitors, predominantly Russia and China. Where does this stand on ocean related things? Well, I'll tell you, um, I know that the previous Chief Naval Operations, uh, Admiral John Richardson, started Task Force Ocean because he, as he put it, we used to be out in front in terms of ocean knowledge. We were halfway around the track in a four-lap race, a mile, we used to call it when I was in high school. Now it's a, a 15 or sorry, it's a, a metric mile, um, 1,600 meters, but or, sorry, it's 1,500 meters, but anyway. And that basically now they're right next to us over our shoulder. And he's very concerned. So he started investing Navy research, or sorry, investing a lot of Navy funds into research and development of ocean things. Very rightly put, it's still going on today. Why do we worry about this with Russia? One of the main areas, and there are many, with their submarine force, their Navy, their Army, you know, very, very capable, near peer. But if you look at the Arctic and the shrinking ice in the, in, in the Arctic, and this is from a roadmap I developed in the Navy back in 2014, we look at transit routes in the Arctic by the middle of the century, possibly opening up for at least one day a year, you might be able to go down this green route without going through any type of hazardous waters or having to go through Russia claimed territory or Canada claimed territory. This represents a massive reduction in trade routes if you're in China or Japan or Korea getting to Northern Europe. For Russia, great impact for them if they can start to, you know, go in and move their goods through the North, East, West, North, South. So you can see the Arctic becomes a place where there's a lot of competition, not just for, you know, for a lot of resources, but transit routes. Anytime in Russia is building up because they want to protect their waters, they say, and who knows, are they gonna go, go after more territory in the future? Not that that's ever happened before in my lifetime. These are concerns around national security and the competition at Russia with 40% of the coastline in the Arctic is looking at these things. We see them build up their military, military Arctic types of capabilities. Then there's the Arctic in terms of territories and who owns what, who can mine what, oil and gas. It's very confusing between the Arctic nations Again, the UN Convention on Law of the Sea comes into place and we don't even get a voice at the table. But it's based on exclusive economic zones, the extended continental shelves, which are measured by oceanographers, all these type of things. Very little territory in the Arctic is international waters. The rest is claimed by someone somehow. So only the blue pieces are the real international waters. China also comes into play wanting to make agreements with people and also saying maybe we should change the rules of the Arctic. So there's more international water space. You can see how it gets complicated. Roughly 30% of the undiscovered natural gas and much of the undiscovered oil and liquid natural gas are in the Arctic. Many in the areas of Russia in terms of natural gas, in terms of oil, a lot of it on the north slope of, of Alaska. As you look at energy needs and concerns in the future, you can see there's a great resource for this. 
And how do we do that or make sure that it's done if we're going to extract it without screwing up a not well understood ecosystem? Huge issues up there. Our national security is at stake because, again, Russia knows it's up there and they are really going after a lot of these things already, especially the natural gas. The next near competitor is China. Where does China sit? China has published a one road, one belt maritime Silk Road initiative, which is they want to be able to move goods, fisheries, fish, all these types of things all around these parts of the Indian and South China Sea. We know they're building islands in the South China Sea over here. They build them on and then they claim it's Chinese territory and they say, well, now our territory in the ocean extends even farther. The UN Convention of Law of the Sea and the UN has ruled that's not true. We don't get a voice. China can say, well, the U.S. is there and I, they haven't even acceded to the UN Convention, so they, they don't have a voice here. These are the type of issues. China says, hey, we're going to behave responsibly. We're going to make sure we take care of the ocean and conserve resources. Yet we see what China has done in that case. We also see what China is doing in Hong Kong right now, arresting nine leaders of the press that they promised they would never do in Hong Kong. So, you know, I have some great friends in the scientific realm in China, but can you trust China to stay by their word? You know, a lot of concerns there. And China really has a strategy to do this, also go along the coast of Africa, also even to South America and up to the Arctic. They have a strategy to build up their maritime ocean type of uh, a lot of ocean activity and economy. China's coastline is small compared to nations like us and even Russia and the Arctic especially. Final one I'll show you on this piece is look where we are in terms of ocean knowledge and expertise. For many years, we were way ahead of China in terms of the number of, the number of scientific and technological papers in esteemed scientific journals. But we started seeing in recent years, China is climbing. They are educating a lot of their people at our universities, which is great for universities. They pay full ride. We, they take those resources to do research, to grow student populations, provide scholarships, increase the student population and diversity, yet we're also sending the best science back to China. And what that's leading to, we're starting to see Chinese papers overtake ours. And by the early, maybe mid-20s even, we're going to see that China is really um, on the, the same, you know, they're pretty much are, are going to be tied or close to us in terms of published articles, which relates to scientific expertise. All right, so I've given you a lot of concerns. One of the final ones I'll talk about is what if we were to have a World War of fish? This issue of uh, the illegal, unreported, unregulated fishing that's happening in overfishing and the, you know, a, a lot of ecosystems failures, many distant fleets from other countries are going to, to other people's waters. Indonesia is burning the boats when they catch them, if they're in their territories. Other issues such as shark fin harvesting you see here on the bottom left. These are killing the high-end predators of our oceans, which are, you know, critical for the health of ecosystems and fisheries. These are the sharks that come out of that. We're seeing this just like we saw what happened um, certainly in Yellowstone with the loss of the wolves and then putting wolves back in place, how it just changed and rebalanced everything. We're seeing the same thing in our, our, our ocean. We look at the future, of more needs of fish and protein. Are we going to end up with competition, not just this type of thing, but actual wars in the future, concerns in the South China Sea and Indian Ocean. So all these things related to the ocean, ocean health, ocean activities are crucial to our national security. So with that, oh yeah, one final thing, if you didn't hear about it, so 250 ships, almost the size of the U.S. Navy, or boats, fishing boats, were recently spotted off the coast of Galapagos. This is, again, from the news uh, just yesterday. And the Navy from Ecuador is surveilling them because they don't want them coming into those waters. Even if they're in international waters, fish don't know the difference. Think of the pristine, the magic environment of the Galapagos being overfished. The impact on the birds, you know, the blue-footed boobies that live there are like nothing else on our planet. They don't have any food sources. So you can see the whole thing is, just starts to fall apart and it creates, it could create conflict. All right, with that, I'm going to stop for a brief uh, moment here. 
And oh, so I'm going to go back and hopefully I'm going to stop sharing my screen. I think we have some questions. So over to you, Louise. Okay. Um, and we'll take a few now. Okay. Uh, John, we have two questions about the uh, UNCLOS treaty. Yes. Um, one, one question is, has the U.S. ever been a signatory of that treaty? And then how long has the U.S. not been a member or a participant in that? So this goes back to the Reagan era. Um, so that's when the treaty was first put into place. So we're thinking, you know, back in that time frame, you know, late 70s, 80s at that time, that's when the treaty was first put out. It really, um, it really goes in and defines a structure what has to do with all kinds of operations, with the fisheries, military operations, what's a territorial sea, what's international water, what's ex extended exclusive economic zone, what you're allowed to do. And everybody signed off to this and, you know, these things, if you can't go in and do research in somebody else's exclusive economic zone without them being privy to that or agreeing and partnering with that because you might do research which could, which could give you an advantage of how to fish or find things in the bottom. All these kind of things are covered. We've never signed it. There has been longstanding a group of Republican senators who've opposed to this. There are some half decent arguments of why we don't want to have our decisions on what we're going to do on the high seas controlled by international authority. But a lot of it in the current age of global economies makes no sense at all. We want to be able to influence other nations. So we have not been a signatory to it. And this is another issue of the mining was always a big piece of it. If we mine things in the ocean by the international laws under UNCLOS, we would likely have to pay a tax. That tax goes into running the International Seabed Authority, that group which goes in and says who can mine where, should we mine or not, given impacts on the ocean. So we don't, so we're not even part of that, but if we don't pay the tax, it's likely, you know, you know, you know, okay, we're losing some of the profits. But if it's a good business, it was, we know, paying in tax, paying tax is not necessarily bad. But people are against this for those type of reasons. So it is a partisan issue. By the way, we're very much a nonpartisan organization. Uh, the oceans and ocean science largely is nonpartisan. We have House and Senate Ocean caucuses that work well together. Issues such as ocean plastics, IUU fishing. Everybody's in agreement. These are horrible things, and we've got to put a stop to these things. So the ocean's largely, but this is one issue that uh, we should really take on. I think I can see also if a Biden administration would actually come in, if they make oceans as part of climate change and other issues and the things on the top of that, if that's a top priority, us being a more of a global leader by ratifying UNCLOS should be a top sort of administration type of priority and it should be vocal. They should get with the caucuses, get with the states who have ocean investments, some of them are Republican states like along the Gulf Coast, and put pressure on people because we can actually have a better ocean economy if we accede to this and there are arguments for that. So that's a high level. Again, it's a deep issue. 60 minutes dived into it for about five or a 15 minute segment on, on deep sea mining. But happy again, if anybody wants to talk more about it, you can find me online, happy to do that. Next question, uh, John, is uh, uh, for you to address the relevance of the law of the sea treaty, which includes provisions on seabed mining. And how would you advise the Biden administration to do it uh, regarding US, to do regarding US ratification of that? The law of sea treaty. Yeah. And, and that's the same, that's what I was just sort of oh, referring okay. to a little bit, Louise. Okay. It really has to be a party strategy with a strong voice. Again, every Secretary of Defense, every Chief of Naval Operations, or every Commandant of the Coast Guard, every President, including most in the current administration, the President coming up personally on this one, has supported the ratification of the law of the sea treaty. We can use that to our effect. So that's what I would do. I'd make it a principle part of my platform going in and how to really make us more of a maritime leader. Okay, thank you. Um, another comment here is that solving problems that you describe or you're talking about will get more difficult as pop the population of the world increases. What do you do? Population explosion is not a polite term, but there are just too many people on the planet already. And how will that impact ocean decisions? Yeah, and boy, you know, 
One reason I became a scientist, a physical scientist, ocean scientist, because the hardest thing to do is to model and predict and influence human behavior. So I'm going to throw that back to all of you in this room because I know there's a lot of smart people who understand this. But I do believe, as do a lot of others, that population growth, and it's all the models say that the greatest population growth from now through the middle of the century is going to be in African parts of Asia who are impoverished and can least afford the expanding growth in population. So I don't have the answers, but it is a problem. It's a problem we don't like to talk about. There are religious implications to this. It's a tough one, but boy, you're exactly right in my opinion. Okay. All right. How will, I have only two more questions at this point, uh, John. Um, how will ocean acidification impact the world's food chain? So I'm, I'm, I'm going to get into that next. I think that's a great segue, Louise. I can go back to sharing my screen again and showing you a few slides if we take that okay. a Yep. All right, let's do that. Uh, all right. And the questions. All right. Everything's working again for my end. All right, so now we're going to look at some of the other securities and food security, ocean acidification. We're going to come into that. All right, homeland security. Again, a lot of this is to do with the changing physical ocean at parameters. Uh, top left, this is a real picture several years ago of a typhoon in China that just wiped out a coastal area. This is waves and storm surge on, you know, the tides and everything else. Bottom left is small island. You know, it's called small island. It, developmental states or SIDs or small island disappearing states, we refer to them. Sea level rise is creating huge impacts on our homeland, not to mention the other climates of more storms, things like this. When are we gonna start to say, well, FEMA is in the Department of Homeland Security, but when does Homeland Security start to look at things like sea level rise, catastrophic weather events, when does that become a priority because we see what it has done um, anyway? Just a thought there, but these are huge impacts on our homeland and a lot of other people's homelands. Food security. We have issues such as overfishing I talked about briefly. Fishing and creating toxins. Who would want to eat fish that are caught here? We have aquaculture going on in the bottom right in many places, but is it sustainable? Is it environmentally responsible? We're putting, you know, things in the water, toxins and things. We don't want to be there. Who's ensuring that? without US leadership necessarily. And then the top right, this is a picture from uh, a decade ago, prior to the issues in Syria, when there was a four year drought caused by climate change. A lot of this due to the changes impacting the ocean as well. The farmers couldn't grow crops. They fled to the big cities. Uh, the city of Damascus especially became overcrowded. People didn't have enough food. They became uh, you know, they were very you know, upset and resentful of the government. You end up with revolution, and the next thing you know, you got a conflict. So food security, leading to national security, things we see this. And the ocean, ocean health is critical to this for the reasons I talked about. And again, add another, add another billion, billion and a half, two billion people, and more and more of them are in coastal African and Asian areas that rely more and more on fish from the sea, overfishing taking place. Then we add on that this issue of ocean acidification. You know, ocean acidification impacts the ability of shellfish especially to form calcium type of shells and other things. These are corals, these are oysters, clams. These are basin, you know, these are parts of, you know, the, a huge part of the food webs, a huge part of what happens. We know what great job oysters did in the Chesapeake of filtering out all the types of toxins and, and various types of pollutants. We know the Chesapeake is a lot cleaner thanks to a lot of efforts of many people, probably some of you. Oysters filter that out. If we get an ocean that is more and more acidic, those organisms can't do as well. This shows you one day old what a healthy normal pH ocean type of larva looks like and what one that's not so healthy. And those little spats as they're called, which actually is a derivative of spit because it looks like a slimy little thing that comes out of your mouth. That's true. This is what grows and sticks to a shell and starts to form anyway. Uh, so you see ocean acidification and the impact on calcium is a key part of what's happening. There are other impacts on, you know, what happens with plant life and other types of animal, for animal life as well. This is one of the key ones. By the way, certain types of seagrasses, many of which have been damaged through dredging and things like that, are good at balancing pH. So you start to wipe out some of the seagrasses and you can see there are a lot of 
other complications to this. One thing about food security that we're really starting to see, and there was an article just recently, it was reprinted from 2019 about people in Maine, lobster people, lobster fishermen, lobster men and women, of switching over in the non-lobster season of growing seaweed. We really start to look at integrated multi-trophic aquaculture, farming of the sea, but doing it like we've learned to do it on land. Now we do a lot of farming with catfish and even salmon and recirculating, recirculating systems in landlocked areas. We have issues in this nation of doing fish farming out of the open seas. Regulatory authorities, regulatory type things are outdated. We're trying to fix those. There's legislative efforts in place to do that. But the bottom line is we know in the U.S. how to do this. We have the best scientists that can really from, from seaweed to finfish, including things such as cobia, maybe even tuna, could have a full system where shellfish, vegetables, even what cows eat very healthy could be done by this type of system. We, should, we need to be planning for this all over the planet and leading efforts there. So there are options. And then, by the way, this is jobs. This is U.S. economy, global economy, if we can do this right. So it's not just fixing problems, it's advancing economy as well. Water security on top of food security as people, you know, start running out of water. We see, you know, what used to be huge lake basins are now drying up. Water is going elsewhere. Of course, people aren't enough water. We see, you know, the type of uh, a desalination plant, a steam type of desalination plant that's run by oil and gas creates a lot of air pollution and other types of problems. It's what you see in the bottom left, a huge one in the, over in the Arabian or Persian Gulf area. But in the future, we're starting to experiment with solar powered type of desalination of, our, you know, reverse osmosis so the water gets through a membrane and not the stuff that's in there. So these type of things. So we're looking at the future. We can do a lot more with water security. Of course, California has a lot of desalination efforts going on as well. Again, ocean science and technology can help solve these problems if we take it seriously. Jobs involved. Energy security is another one. We see more and more, and even energy companies such as Shell investing in wind turbines offshore. So what does that mean? That means that, you know, the offshore environment changes. Commercial fishermen, their practices have to change a little bit. Military and their operational areas may be impacted. But if we want to get off of the oil and gas and the carbon-based fuels, we need to start looking at these type of things. We also have ocean thermal energy conversion, wave energy, but we're going to be there with oil and gas infrastructure for a long time. This is an oil rig in the Gulf of Mexico in the bottom right. We have to realize, and sometimes when we put things in the water for long periods of time, good stuff happens. One of the best dive sites in the Gulf of Mexico is on an older oil rig in the flower gardens area. And this is beautiful. You can see the type coral has grown well on there. So when sometimes when we put things in the water, maybe not for good reason, but we have infrastructure. So it's complicated. So as well, but we have to understand, but we have to make sure we're looking at the ocean. We support energy companies such as Shell and even Chevron, who has demonstrated a commitment to looking after the environment and doing ocean scientific research at the time. They're also going after energy and trying to switch to more, um, you know, to more re renewable energy sources. So energy security in the ocean. By the way, anytime we put something in the ocean like this, it should be observing the ocean. Great chances to put stuff on it to observe the ocean conditions, the scientific stuff I talked about earlier. We're not doing that nearly enough. It should be a requirement. I think that's another thing that a new administration could do. All right. Human health type of issues. We see this with toxins, plastic, and pollution, negative impacts. The growth of antibiotic resistant Bacteria in our coastal areas and inland waterways from the ocean of huge impact. Some people in Europe uh, and part of the UN have actually gone in and pro projected by middle of the century more people will die from antibiotic resistant bacteria than, than they will die from cancer. So huge issues there. We look at the ocean though, and this is a super giant amphipod from the lowest, from the deepest parts of our ocean in the Mariana Trench. Its nervous system and cells are amazingly resilient and they regrow, they regenerate like no nerve cells of any other organisms. This is being used to treat things like you know, Alzheimer's and dementia, 
these type of mental issues as well as we can learn how, the, how those cells work and treat our own cells and those of animal life as well. We can also look at how to recapture plastics and make things like shoes. We can all now buy things made out of fishing line and stuff like that. So human health and the ocean are very closely related. More on the plastics in a little bit. We look at our economic pr prosperity for us and our partners around the world and we say, okay, what's happening? Things are changing a lot with invasive species. You know, lionfish that, that used to be in the Gulf of Mexico and Atlantic and Caribbean when I learned to die there and died there for many years. Now my wife and I used to love to see them in the Indian and Pacific Oceans. I mean, we we're stationed on Guam. Now we dread seeing them in this area because they're taking over habitats of snapper and grouper and the entire ecosystem changing. Super giant jellyfish that are growing because the food competitors in China, the sardines uh, and fish like that have been overfished. So now the jellyfish, which aren't as good at fishing for the planktonic type of things, they don't have any competition, so they're growing. These jellyfish can get the size of Volkswagens. And they go up the current off the coast of Asia, right up into the Sea of Japan, and instead of having fish, which they've relied on for centuries, they're catching jellyfish. So a few examples. I'll talk about deep sea mining, harmful algal blooms. Nobody wants to go stay at a, you know, a beach resort, harmful algal blooms. You look at sea level rise, but then look at the opportunities we might have to start to design, engineer, architect, and build ocean resilient coastal areas and cities in the future. We have the smarts to do this. It's huge investments. We know that. But again, if we, re if we understand the importance of this, we can do this well. The nations and islands like Singapore have taught us how to do this. In the Netherlands, with their issues where most of the nation is below sea level, they figured out how to do some of these things. Yes, we have an immensely grander scale of problem, but I suggest we have an immensely grander scale of opportunity as well. Again, all these relate to jobs and economy. All right, I'm gonna dive into ocean plastics here just a little bit because it's such an important issue. We have, and this is a picture of a whale that was washed up in the Philippines. Uh, they found over 100 pounds of plastic in its stomach now. This was doctored, people threw a bunch more plastic in there to take a picture, but they left it there. And yes, kids are playing with plastic and you have a whale carcass that's covered in plastic. Yes, it's over dramatized, but it's true. Large mammals we know are dying from plastic. One of the other issues is microplastic, plastic that is smaller than five millimeters in size. So this is, you know, a half a centimeter or less. And what impact does it have as it gets into the stomachs and the organs and some of the nanoplastics we're calling them now again less than half a millimeter are starting to get into cellular tissues. We don't even know what the impacts long term and short term are on organs. Also guess what? We eat this stuff too through the fish, through the food web and then we get biological amplification in our own bodies. We don't know what the impacts will be long term. What we do know is a lot of plastics come from not just water bottles but Think of the little fibers from polyester, from the fleeces we all love to wear. And the best deals are the ones that, of course, you know, the, the least expense are the ones that made with the ones that are more dangerous. You, they get out through our washers and the water systems that may or may not filter as well. You can understand it. But there are great things going on to clean up the ocean. This is an entrepreneur, again, from the Netherlands, Boylan Slat, who's got a ship and nets in the Pacific trying to clean up the garbage patch, which is really most of the ocean is not just one patch. It's plastics that are throughout a large part of the, the, the actual currents out there. And we educate. We did, a, we did a project for two months on the mall a couple of years ago. Maybe some of you walked through at the Ocean Plastics Laboratory. I was on the last day. I had a shift there. I walked back down, uh, down, uh, down 14th Street. Uh, 14th Street in in DC, 14th Street Northwest, this is a trash can. So some of the people who may walk through the Ocean Plastic Lab over here, again, we don't have the waste management. The waste management process is broken, and this country is better than most. By the way, Arlington is one of the best in the country. Again, thanks to a lot of you, one reason I'm here. We use very environmentally responsible incineration of a lot of trash, plus we have good recycling programs. And when we know there are issues of what we can and can't actually, actually re recycle, we use it to make energy, we burn it, but it's also making energy to drive down our consumption of other carbon-based fuels. 
And the real thing is, we just don't know. A lot of questions about plastics we need to study. But again, if they're, you know, one estimate is by the middle of the century, the mass of plastic in the ocean will exceed the mass of fish. A scary thought. If you've been to beaches around the world, you know that's not that far, you know, it's not that outlandish. All right, so there's a few more. I'll say any quick questions before I think, uh, where are we here? Yeah, so a few quick questions and I'll close it out uh, with a few final observations of where do we go from here? And then the final round of questions. Well, I thought I'd pause here and take a couple, so I'll stop sharing again. Okay. A drink from my mug of ice water, I promise you, and uh, we'll go from there. Okay, uh, one question is, uh, back to an earlier part of your presentation, does your consortium cooperate with China's effort to save endangered species such as sea turtles? Uh, so the answer is yes, largely through the work of our member institutions. We have convened meetings. Uh, we actually worked with China in a long ago effort called Census of Marine Life to understand what was going on with the population of, of organisms. We're hoping, and by the way, upcoming, and I'll point this slide, there's a UN Decade of Ocean Science starting in January of next year. China is gonna be part of it as well. The US has been not very active in the UN, so we've not been leading. But yes, we work with the scientists in China. What we're really, you know, so there's a great scientific type of cooperation and collaboration. I'll tell you, actually, the majority of ocean scientists in China would like to be in, in the US. There's some evidence to that based on some surveys and things. But, you know, they have to go by and where their families are, you know, how the Chinese government works. So it's not really so, you know, there are ways to look at China. One, you can't trust the government. The other one is hopefully over time by having more and more Chinese, you know, our friends, our, you know, a lot of great folks that work, that more and more of them are educated in scientific realms, that they will start to influence the track of China in their overall type of be behavior. So we do work with them, but our governments do not work with them well at all in a lot of these issues. We talk, but we don't invest together. We don't solve problems together. Again, I'm cautiously optimistic that might change, but is it going to be in time as China dumps massive amounts of pollutants and plastics, China overfishes all over the planet, including in other people's territories? Good question. Okay. Uh, another question is that there was news coverage, news coverage several years ago about how rising sea levels were endangering, endangering the Navy's ports in places like Norfolk, Virginia. Has any been progress been made in addressing this concern? <laughs> yes, is the answer. So the, the military has made investments in the infrastructure. They're actually taking a look at sea level rise models as they build new buildings, including new buildings at Annapolis. Uh, but I suggest they're not doing it well enough and the money's just not there to make some hard type of decisions. But at some point, we've got to really take a look at some of our bases along the Gulf Coast as I talked about, maybe even Norfolk and, and you know, in that area, the largest Navy base in the world. Okay, are we gonna build the infrastructure that can actually go in and keep the sea out in another 30, 40 years if it's good? We're gonna have sea level rise with another foot or two which is likely, we've seen, we've been measuring sea level in Norfolk for a hundred years. We've seen 18 inches of sea level rise in that time frame. The rate of rise is changing. So you don't hear about it as much as you did with the last administration, but the Navy leaders, who I spent a lot of time with that food chain of data to analysis to impact and decisions in my leadership of Task Force Climate Change, my predecessor and successor as well, it's still happening not nearly with enough focus. So, and this is, these are issues, but you see state, and it's a hard problem, because it's not just a Navy base. Where does a Navy get its power from? Where does its sewer go? Is the roadways, the life, where the people live in neighborhoods that were built on top of wetlands in the 70s that are flooding now, and you're paying your tax dollars toward, um, uh, toward a lot of FEMA work with flood insurance. It's raising homes six feet. Well, you know, is that the right answer? Or should we be saying maybe homes would be better put somewhere else? Again, you know, a couple hundred thousand to raise a home that actually isn't even worth that much, but raise it six feet because that's the way our flood insurance systems work. So yes, this is a hard problem and we're not addressing it to the extent we need to. We're doing it better than we were a decade ago, but we're still mm, just in the sort of the primary school level of work here. 
And the last question uh, right now, John, is in your opinion, who publishes the best model and data for sea rise, sea level rise? I go with the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, NOAA. They do, they lead the National Climate Assessment, the U.S. National Climate Assessment, which was published the last one under this administration. It's very good. It gives you, it's a long book, but there's executive summary. Look at National Climate Assessment. Go to NOAA's webpage. You can surf around, you can look at sea level rise. You can actually go in <clears throat> and pick up a poor to state and area and look at what sea level rise has done in the past. Sea level rise is a little complicated because Parts of the nation are also sinking or subsiding as global sea level rise comes up. So in Norfolk, one of the areas that's subsiding as fast as global sea level is rising, so it's a double whammy, okay? Same thing with parts of the Gulf Coast, including the city of New Orleans. Other areas in the, the parts of the Pacific and others, the, they're actually rising because of the way that our earth plates move and things like that. So. But yes, NOAA is where I would go. You can read the international or the interagency panel on climate change and the international thing. Again, it's a, it's a tome of a zillion pages. The NOAA National Climate Assessment and then NOAA's webpage, go in and surf for that. You can find out a lot of information. They're, they're the best. They, have still, they, they have a climate office. I think we saw that office. It's still being well-funded, by the way. Uh, Congress hasn't let it been cut to the near that some of the budgetary efforts from the White House have gone forward. By the way, you know, this administration has actually funded ocean science as well or better than the last one in many areas. So again, nonpartisan things going on there, but yeah, so that's, uh, that's where I'd go. All right, let's go I, back I to one the more question. I have one more question, but I'm going to save it to the end, John. Okay. So you're on again. Okay. Maybe I am, if I can get there. Let's hope so. Uh, we're here, there we go. And I'll share my screen. All right, 97 clicks and five more dead brain cells and I'm good to go. All right, uh, so where are we at? We know a lot. We know a lot about the Earth system, how the ocean, weather, climate, ice land all impact. We understand more so now than we did even a decade or 20 years ago when it impacts our national security, homeland security, food security, dot, dot, dot. But do we really understand the interactions of these things in this earth system as a whole? And the answer is we're getting there, but we're still fractured in terms of agencies, in terms of nations, in terms of who's doing what. Again, this is a global problem. Yes, we're focused on COVID right now and rightfully so. But once we get this off, the hope and prayers, you know, not in the too far distant future, we've got to come back to the environment and we've got to come back to understanding it. Here's where I tell you where we're at right now. It's little kids soccer practice, okay? Each nation, each agency, each office has their area practicing with their own little model. The Air Force runs its own weather model. And NOAA runs its own weather model. Your National Weather Service and Navy has its own weather model. But, you know, we talk a lot, we collaborate, we have a great time. Our parents eat a bunch of oranges on the sidelines and the kids don't, it's great. But we're not getting there. This is where we have gotta be. We have gotta get to World Cup level understanding of the Earth system. We have the science, the technology, and I would argue what we are missing right now are ships. Maybe ships, wait, I not saw, you know, early slide, early, er, early on there, somewhat like this, ships. Well, not these ships. What about these ships? Oceanographic research ships, including icebreakers. Yeah, we need those. But the ships that I'm talking about that we're missing to get to World Cup level are these ships. And at the principal most is leadership. We need to be leading. This needs to be a cabinet level issue for the executive branch. Both, both sides of Congress need to be taking this on even more than they are today. And then we need to understand that we own this problem. We have the smarts, we've got the ability, and we have the resources to get after this. And if we can partner across the sectors that I talked about, across the nations, we can understand that we are stewards. Every religion that I've read about talks about being good stewards of the environment, the earth, of what God, 
actually gave to us, whether again, it doesn't matter what religion that, that you're in, we have responsibilities. Where's the religious leaders on this? We saw the Pope on climate change, haven't heard much on that in a few years. We need leaders at all levels. And again, the scholarship, the investments, the, the resource sponsors who sponsored the research. So these are the ships, we need a fleet of ships to get after this problem. Leadership opportunities. They're great opportunities, again, through the three branches of the federal government, between you know, the legislative, the executive, and even in terms of the laws that are in place, regulatory structures, certainly are the judicial branch, but also the state governments, even local governments, Many local governments are doing such great things around conservation. They're putting areas off limits to this or that or growing wetlands again and things like that. But boy, you know, we could do more if we could get the leaders to come together and really have a long range strategy, a plan and investment, right? So the great opportunities also, how many ocean scientists do we have in Congress right now? Well, there's one ocean engineer and I think there are none. I, you know, some of my best friends are lawyers. I'm sure a lot of people there, but they're, you know, the ratio of lawyers to earth scientists and the legislative leadership is, you know, pretty discouraging. Uh, it's worse than the ratio of men to women in a lot of the engineering fields. Certainly it's about the same as the ratio uh, of basically the pale stale males like myself to people of color uh, in the engineering and science fields. These are all problems we can solve. They're social problems, but we've got to understand there are great leadership opportunities. We need leaders from many different areas who understand the problems, who can influence this as well. So I try to encourage all the college kids that go talk to my institutions. Which one of you is going to run for Congress? Which one of you is going to be a congressperson, a senator, you know, secretary? Again, Admiral Watkins got a lot done. He was a secretary of energy, a four-star. Many of us are trying to follow in those footsteps, but boy, we need help. Uh, so there's that piece. This administration, and I'm not gonna, again, I'm nonpartisan. The one thing this administration has done well, it's trying to get after this little kid soccer problem in relation to the ocean. First ever a summit, a hundred of the most of the leaders in ocean science and tech brought together in November of last year. They locked the door for a full day in the White House and they said, come out with strategies on the most important issues, which we've actually done strategy on ocean exploration and things like that. More of this type of stuff. Again, there are good decisions, there are bad decisions around ocean and conservation and certainly around, around the issues of, of climate. But at least a lot of leaders, and some of them, many of the leaders, some of the appointees even were in the Obama administration. A lot of the efforts started in the Obama administration and carried through, believe it or not. So again, one, this is an example of that. So under Obama administration, they started the National Ocean Council. Under the Trump administration, they changed it to the Ocean Policy Committee. Okay, change the name, it's the same people, the same offices. They have, an, you know, and there's an executive order on Ocean Policy there. We had implementation in plan here. It was replaced by a new one. A lot of it's the same stuff, a few different words. There's climate, more exploration, more economy, more national security, not a bad thing. Even our ocean exploration, this gets after, again, understanding the ocean, the deep places where those manganese or type of nodules are and things like this. So investing in that, which we've done as well. This came out of this administration. I mentioned this UN decade. Starts again in January of next year. A lot of the European nations are serious, coming together around our, across all of our nations in the UN to really look at ocean science and develop sustainably the future. Looking at population growth. How do we deal with that? Many people, including myself, say if we did it smartly, we could actually have a notion that could help handle and maybe even handle a growth of another billion and a half people within 30, 40, 50 years. We have great opportunities. We've got to get past this. What's missing from the UN decade? The US. Right now, it's not the US decade, it's the UN decade. This runs under UNESCO. The US withdrew from UNESCO. So I'm hoping in the future we might see Again, a Secretary Kerry was an international leader on ocean issues, started the ocean, our, our ocean initiative, several conferences around the world, bringing people, lead, I mean, these are leaders from nation, presidents and secretaries um, from across many countries. Great opportunities there. But policies are great. We can come up with the best policies we want. But as I saw about 
seven years ago, driving down Rock Creek Parkway from the U.S. Naval Observatory where I lived at the time on the way to the Pentagon, there was a policy that said no trucks down Rock Creek Parkway because the bridges are too short. They're only 12 feet high. People don't follow them. This gets to the thing, I'll throw it back on you guys as well. How do we change behaviors? Stuck truck in many ways in terms of looking after the earth and throwing trash all over the place and not having good waste management systems. We're a bunch of stuck trucks. A review. These are security issues. Science and technology have great opportunities to help resolve those. Science-based decision-making is preeminent in terms of what we need to do. Again, it starts at the science level. Our investment in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics in the ocean. Kids love to go to aquariums. Kids from all backgrounds, inner city kids and things like that. One thing I'm trying to do with the National Ocean Sciences Bowl is how do we get more of the underrepresented populations involved in ocean science and technology? Again, greatly underrepresented in many, many areas. If you want to be, a, whether it's an IT person, if you want to study chemistry, physics, you want to study sociology, there's a lot of ocean opportunities. I've talked about the ocean economy opportunities to get toward the right decisions going forward to inform a better future for our ocean. These are the things I talked about in terms of science and tech that can allow us to do just that. Um, again, these are the things people love to work in. Artificial intelligence. Think of things that are swimming all over the ocean in another 20 years observing the ocean. They see change. They see a fish, fish population is dying off in a fishery because they're measuring the environmental DNA, the free floating DNA from that species. The concentration of it goes down. They say, hey, we need to close down this area for fishing or we need to find out where the fish are going. They can help us advance the regulations and policies in real time changes. We do that now based on crude systems of doing fish counts based on what's being caught. Again, you're trying to drive looking in the rear view mirror in that case. Great opportunities. I'm hoping again, as this is a nation built on the foundations of science and technology and industry and mechanics and innovation, we can get after these problems. Uh, there's that. And in the end, if we can do that, and it gets after this balance on the right side of the scale here, the right investments, after the right knowledge, have the right smarts to make the right decisions, there are opportunities to get this right. I don't know when the tipping points are. Everybody's asking, well, okay, John, so when does this scale on the left hit bottom? <laughs> when does it break? I don't know. I know there are lots, there are lots of concerns, but we also see amazing things. They're going back to the sea turtles. Because we did consider sea turtles as an endangered species, and we did that in agreement with other nations, including China, I think, although I'd have to check on that one, because, you know, and certainly including a lot of nations who were out on turtle soup for a long time, we've seen a rebound in populations of many of the sea turtle species, and a lot faster than anybody would have predicted. Again, the wolves in Yellowstone name changes within, you know, a handful of years. The ocean is incredibly resilient. Our planet is incredibly resilient. And I can guarantee you this, if we get to a tipping point or a series of tipping points where the human population is decimated or non-existent even, the planet's gonna still be around. The ocean's gonna still be around. It might not look quite like it did, or it may take thousands or millions of years to get back to where it started from with healthy coral reefs. And maybe there'll be a different species of top line predator other than us. But the ocean is going to be around. Our challenge is how do we, as responsible, intelligent people, make that change now to try to help advance this planet? Because really, this is the deal. It's really our survival is at stake. And it's not just us, it's all life on, on the planet. I think everybody here hopefully understands this. I hopefully I've been able to impart a little bit of insight more specific on some of these problems. I'm happy to take questions now on more of them. I am also very happy, again, you can Google me, Google our, our you, know, the, you know, the organization, find my email. You wanna talk or get any other time, you know, wanna get me to come talk to smaller groups or any of the people that work for me who are younger and smarter and better looking, happy to do that as well. But right now, as we enter into what I hope is really gonna be a decade of the ocean, like no other decade the UN has ever had, we've gotta take advantage of the opportunity. 
So with that, the ocean is blue, but blues in the ocean isn't necessarily a bad, bad thing. Better a blue ocean than a brown ocean. And so when we think of ocean blues, we can think of, yeah, it's frustrating, and I can write you a hundred blues songs about the plastic and the whales and some of the songs by people like Jimmy Buffett, but I can tell you, there's also a lot of positive opportunity here. So that, back over to you, Louise, for my final round of Q&A until we wrap Okay, up we have a, a, couple, a couple more questions, John. Um, one is the wind turbines that you showed a, a photo of, um, do they affect ocean sea life at all? That is a huge question. Um, it's uncertain how much they do. We know that everything we put in the ocean affects sea life. The question is how much and does it, does it affect sea life in terms of the planktonic sea life? So as we look at currents and changing and things that are happening on the surface, does it, you know, the current that may be flowing through cables that we're getting it back to shore that creates an electromagnetic field, does that impact breeding? Some studies say it does. What happens to the, you know, does it change current flow around some of the scallop beds and things like that? Most of the science now indicates that these changes are not significant. The same with birds and things like that. Also the noise of putting the turbines in, that's one of the biggest concerns with some of the endangered species of whales, the North Atlantic white whale, with the noise of putting the turbines in, once they're running, they really don't have you're really loud enough noise in the ocean, but the putting them in, will that create problems of breeding of, of endangered species? So the answer is, what hurts worse is having a climate where the globe continues to warm because of the consumption of fossil fuels. If we can get enough wind energy to cut significantly the amount of fossil fuel usage, that would have a much more positive impact, I believe, than anything. But at the end of the day, we've got to invest in the science and technology to get after, the, uh, after that. So that's my hypothesis. Now we've got to do the lab work to prove the right answers. We gotcha. have arguments between commercial fishermen, scientists, government here, investors in the energy. So now you've got some of the environmental groups around climate change going against some of the environmental groups that are, at, that are actually trying to make sure that we don't kill whales. It's, you know, it gets to be really mixed up. Gotcha. But, uh, yeah, it's a great question we're trying to answer. Well, also related to the impact on uh, sea life, it's a question about when an oil uh, tanker spills water into their, to the ocean, um, one is, are they fined? And secondly, what is the actual effect of uh, the spilled oil on sea life? Uh, well, <laughs> so yeah, so the stuff that comes out of ships, as we call it, <laughs> Uh, and it's pretty interesting because there's, there's been a lot of international work that the International Maritime Organization to put codes into place, not just around oil spill and the types of ships that have to be certified. You know, yes, we know countries cheat, but most of them are on board because they understand the impacts that oil spills can have on economy, life, and everything else. Uh, but then you get into issues of ballast water. This is the water that you put into the tanks. So when you go overseas, you pump your oil off into somebody else and sell it. You put seawater in there to basically so that the ship isn't, you know, that it's, you know, that's got enough weight so it's stable again to go back to where it got its oil and gas from. So that ballast water cannot be released unless it's been treated and certified as safe because of toxins, also because of invasive species. We know this is how many invasive species have gotten spread. Probably not lionfish, but a lot of other organisms including some of the algae and harmful algae and things and stuff like that that move around the world because of ballast water. So we have internationally approved ballast water treatments. We actually have better treatments now that have not been internationally approved or treatments have been approved by international but not the U.S. Coast Guard. It all gets mixed up. One good thing that's happened, the International Maritime Organization, the Polar Code as it's called, great restrictions on fishing and also in terms of what's on you know, of anything that takes place in the Arctic. Nothing can be put over the side in the Arctic. Russia says they're on board because Russia knows their future in terms of their Arctic economy relies on a, you know, a productive and resilient ocean. Again, fishing moratorium till the 2030s for any type of co commercial fishing in the Arctic. It's a great thing. 
So at least we're, maybe we can come together and get the Arctic right and have that go in and look at how we treat about a, you know, the rest of, of our waters, lakes, and oceans. But yeah, it's a huge issue of what comes out of ships and what damage is it done for the many reasons that I talked about. So the, the good news is that it is an international type of uh, international issue and priority, not directly associated with UNCLOS. So we do have a leadership representation at the UN, so good stuff. Yeah, probably longer than you wanted to hear, but yeah, go ahead. Next. An another question. I only have two more, John. Uh, one, is, the first one is, what do you suggest as a start to deal with the microplastic organisms in our ocean? Well, the the, one is, you know, right now you saw the efforts that I talked about, about getting out and cleaning up the mess. So we're trying to clean up basically, you know, a bunch of water that's been spilled on the floor, but we know the water is coming from a leak of, the line going to the ice maker in the refrigerator, or sorry, in the freezer, that's where you make ice. So we can clean up all we want, but the, water, but the spill is getting bigger and bigger. What do you gotta do first? You gotta fix the source. We gotta go to the source. This is all about plastic, the source of plastics and waste management. The US is actually the, probably the best nation of our size, certainly in the world in terms of dealing with waste management. The process that I talked about, even incineration, but recycling, think of if we really had a waste management type, if we grew that industry to the point of to make sure we're not putting, you know, we're putting a fraction of plastic. For every garbage bag of trash that is pulled up off of the beaches, even in the US, every, you know, for, you know, if it takes you a minute to go out and fill up a, a garbage bag, a hundred of them go right back in the ocean during that same minute. You can go out and see it in the river here. What do you think the water from the Potomac River goes? But what I look, as you go a little bit south here around Quantico and some of the coastal areas around the Mallows Bay Sea area over Maryland, whatever, you'll see plastic everywhere. That's just a fraction of what's going into the Chesapeake and going out to sea. So even this, so we, so we, but we got to stop it. There are many things, there's a, you know, there's all kinds of various type of initiatives, but it starts at the source. Leadership and waste management and international regulations and in in investment. It also has to do with waste management in terms of not just our pollution in the ocean, our pollution everywhere. And this gets into toxins, farmlands, and things like that. By the way, even plastic fibers that get into waterways in St. Louis go into the Mississippi River and make their way into the Gulf of Mexico, as do fertilizers and nutrients that, why do we use fertilizers? Because plants grow. Fertilizers get into the Gulf of Mexico, algae growth and we have harmful algal blooms and they kill off fish so waste management environmental regulations that make sense the people investing in the industrial infrastructure to do that in the midst of trying to fix all of our other infrastructure crucially important that's how we fix it We've got to start at the source gotcha uh well i'd like to echo uh, a number of thank yous um uh, Somebody, Frank uh, Maddox just sent us a note on, uh, saying, fantastic presentation, so enjoyable to be intellectually stimulated. So uh, I think we would all echo that. There. there is one burning question though out there, John. You have several fans of your shirt and people would like to know where to get it. Easy, really easy to get this shirt. All you have to do is get over to the Navy Exchange in Honolulu, Hawaii. <laughs> <laughs> Bought off the road. Oh. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, maybe maybe you would lead lead I that. Would, uh, and, uh, <laughs> I would say send me a note or whatever. I don't even know what ran it off. I'm not going to take it off to figure it out. Uh, okay. Well, just I, to let you know, everyone's you admiring it. So, so, yeah. But yeah, this is one I bought. A lot of, if you want to get really good Hawaiian shirts with lots of sea life, go to the islands and do that. Unfortunately, I'm not personally going to get on an airplane to go over there anytime soon. Hawaii won't let you in unless you got a test and two weeks worth of quarantine as well. Right. There are also some great shirts around here too, but yeah, that, that's a great one. Uh, anyway, well, thanks for what you said about my shirt. Again, if anybody wants to talk to me, uh, anybody wants to find out more, find out other, what institutions are doing, some of our members and things like that, I'm happy to do that as well. Uh, I'm hoping I'll be able to share a little bit of knowledge with you. What I am is a conduit of the amazing, especially young men and women again, who are, doing the science and technological work at our institutions, laboratories, universities, aquariums, National Aquarium, New England Aquarium. Those are some of our, our members that, as well. Champion them, thank them. And as you have the opportunity, please support them, especially during this time period. 
Many of our members are hurting, you know, our academic institutions are hurting because of COVID, the enrollment's down, foreign enrollment is way down. Again, I talked about, you know, that issue in terms of uh, university economics. These are times where, you know, we're facing a lot of challenges. So what we can do is also realize that and help figure out ways to solve the problems, whether it's advocacy and influence or our own investments. So thank you, it's been an honor and I look forward to meeting many more of you in person and seeing you again. Well, I, I think everybody really enjoyed this presentation, John. So thank you very much. And you certainly are the, the expert to bring this to us. So, so thank you very, very much for joining us today.